Chase and I are back in the studio after what seems like an eternity away, but once again, it's another episode of the Grappling Bulletin Podcast. I feel like it's been a very long time. I missed an episode because I was away on vacation, mm -hmm. and then we've had lots of events. Where last week we should have done a show, but of course we were all traveling back from ADCC trials in Atlantic City. But uh, there's a lot of stuff to catch up on. A lot happened over this last week or so. Hopefully, Chase and I still have enough energy left to bring you the news and results because we were in Las Vegas last weekend. Yes, the succubus of a city that that is, but it was fun. The Masters Worlds is a great time, and uh, the GP was also particularly entertaining. I always enjoy uh, the mix of, of high-level competition that you also get to see um, at Masters Worlds and the Jiu Jitsu Con event, right? Where the adult competitors get to compete. See, that's what I enjoyed as well. Was the whole kind of like the coming together of the Jiu Jitsu community mm -hmm. after such mm -hmm. a long time uh, of not really kind of hanging out together too much, you know. Um, I was catching up with people from all over the country. In fact, actually quite a lot of international uh, visitors as well. Because the Jiu Jitsu Con, I'm not sure people realize how big it is, right? It's it massive. is huge now for a start there were over 5,000 people registered for the world masters championships that had 24 mats running at the same time and then they had the convention space with all the exhibitors and the booths and the vendors and stuff then they had another tournament running the jujitsu con which had both gi and no gi and kids divisions that was another 12 mats so 36 mats running simultaneously, and then all the other stuff going on, free seminars, right? Mm -hmm. A little bit of everything. You went to the seminars too, right? Yeah, I caught a couple seminars, you know, to kick things off with Atos and Andre Galvao and Andy Murasaki and Rafael Aguetti is doing their thing. Uh, then I went to the Checkmat seminar, which was a lot of fun. Leo Vieira, Gabriel Almeida, Hanato Canuto. And then kick, uh, finished it off with uh, Shane Jamil Hill Taylor showing some things, which was actually incredible. That yeah, video stuff. The, uh, the lasso stuff. Actually, Ooh. everyone was doing lasso work. All oh. the seminars I went to had some lasso in it. So maybe theme of the weekend. Maybe lasso's making a strong comeback, right? Um, in any case, a lot of fun. Uh, I definitely recommend if you guys didn't get to go this year to try it again because it's more than just a competition, right? It really yeah. is a celebration of jujitsu. It's a great way of putting it. Leo Vieira called it a festival, and I think that's pretty accurate. Yeah, feel feel feels like it, you know. When you get so many people, I think for some people as well, it's the high point of the year. You know, when you meet um, jujitsu practitioners from places like I was meeting people from Colorado, from South Dakota, from Missouri, from Nebraska, and they're like, yeah, you know, this is it, right? Going to Vegas for the big one each year is um, is definitely a treat for us who travel all the time to these different events. We're sometimes spoiled, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I think it was um, it was nice to catch up with everybody, see a lot of familiar faces, and some good action. So of course, there was the Masters Worlds that went down. That was a lot of fun. Uh, we reported on the Masters 1 Black Belt Divisions. Um, but of course, you had people competing all the way up to Master 7, over the age of 60. It's mm -hmm. incredible, mm -hmm. absolutely incredible to see such veteran practitioners on the mats. Um, but the, the IBJJF GPs, the heavyweight and the middleweight GPs, went down on the final day of the tournament. Tynan Dalpra won the middleweight GP with a submission in the final uh, against uh, Jonathan Gracie after having beaten Hanato Kinuto by points in the earlier round. And then in the heavyweight uh, GP, you had uh, Victor Hugo emerge the winner, beating Muhammad Ali by submission in the final after a uh, pretty solid, tight, but solid win over Gustavo Batista in his opening round. Now, it's the match with Muhammad Ali that has sparked debate hmm. as the finishing technique that he used in that match. It was a submission. Now, for all intents and purposes, it was a leg lock. It was an ankle lock, but with a slight twist and... Leo Vieira. You're making a pun there, Hal. A slight twist, it was, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Leo Vieira, the Checkmat founder and head coach, took to Instagram yesterday, and he basically called out, not Victor, important to note, he didn't call out Victor, but he called out the IBJJF for uh, allowing an illegal leg lock, but to be permitted. He says that there's a gray area that this leg lock is a twisting leg lock and it should be against the rules but it's some right now there's little clarification as to exactly the mechanics of the move and maybe the referees and the officials haven't been told or are unaware of of the nature of this move like mechanically speaking leo's like listen this is an illegal move victor used it to win not taking anything away from him mm -hmm. but it shouldn't be allowed so let's play a little clip of this because we have a video of Victor using this technique right here. 
And Chase, I know you've actually felt this leg lock before. Maybe you could talk us through it a little bit of uh, exactly kind of like what's going on. Yeah, it doesn't feel great, let me tell you. Um, very powerful leg lock. And what you see, uh, some people might call an Aoki lock. Others sometimes it's referred to as simply a modified uh, ankle lock. But there is actually a significant amount of force there on the knee. And really, this gets set up by letting the toes drop slightly from the armpit kind of like a heel hook. Well, you can see the and heel see slip here, The heel right? drops down. Yeah. And so there's torque on the side of the knee, uh, the inside of the knee, rather, as well as the ankle. And the reason why this is still technically, I think, permissible, despite perhaps applying force that is defined as illegal, is because the rotational break isn't necessarily um, applied by the by Victor Hugo in this case. He is just bridging out with his hips, right. just like you with an ankle lock. He's not turning his arms or rolling with it in any way, but it's the position of the foot that creates that, that, that pressure, which is technically a twisting lock. It's as defined legal as far as the hold, but the, I believe uh, the clarification in the rules is that you cannot have twisting, breaking power, which is sort of what's happening there. Um, it's a nasty, nasty foot lock. For it sure. really is. And it definitely does look like the Aoki lock. I, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, if Victor himself or any other geek practitioners would call it that. Uh, the no-geek guys, they certainly know the Aoki lock. It's It looks like a straight ankle lock, but the heel has slipped out inside. And it's a, it's a very, very painful move. And you could see the way that Muhammad Ali actually kind of, you know, he scream tapped. But then he immediately he was like protesting. Mm -hmm. And I thought at the time... I thought it was a verbal tap and I thought the referee stopped it and I wasn't sure if Muhammad was protesting that or not. But actually, no, what he was protesting is, and you, you can kind of see his face briefly, is that he's like, he's like, man, come on. Like, that wasn't a straight ankle lock. That was my knee, you know? You can see the way he's sort of talking to the, talking to the referee. Yeah, and I think this clip ends just a bit short, but he gestures with his hands in sort of a uh, rotational movement. So I thought after I saw that, that, oh yeah, he had that kind of twisting lock applied. Um, and again, it's, as, as mentioned by Leo Vieira and pointed out, a little bit of a gray area. And I think it's become very common, though. Where there are a lot of right. high-level level grapplers, rather, that, that use this kind of, let's call it exploit. And by no means cheating, but just sort of taking the rules as far as they can. That's what competitors do. Right. And uh, it is more powerful than your standard ankle lock. So, and also... Um, kind of counters the idea of slipping out of the ankle lock, right? So it's a secondary attack, perhaps, to the, what might be the primary sort of uh, goal. Because twisting locks against the knee are not permitted in IBJJF gi matches, right? That you can go for a twisting lock on the ankle, which is basically, you know, the toe hold, but you can only do straight knee bars and straight ankle locks. And you can't go for any kind of rotational breaking force on the knee, like you now can in no gi tournaments. Um, also interesting that Leo specifically says that the straight ankle lock should cover the entire foot because that little heel slippage mm -hmm. does mm -hmm. add in that whole rotational nature to it. So, And that, under the IBJJF rules, is classed as a very serious foul. Number 17 in the rule book, a lock that twists the knee. And uh, it's important to note as well, like you said, that it's not like Victor Hugo is coming out here and purposely using an illegal technique to win. That is not the case. That would be cheating, and that would be punished. The referees know the difference. But jujitsu evolves so quickly. Mm. It's in a constant state of technical development and evolution that sometimes <laughs> problems are created that didn't exist in the past. And the rule book has to be modified, and the referees have to be educated as to exactly what those things are so that they can do their jobs properly, right? Sure, I think it's a fair analysis. Also, maybe a, a bit of a tangent, but I feel like when you watch an instructional, for example, on something like the Ao Aoki lock and it's, it's no gi, it's much more clearly shown someone's wearing shorts, for example, the kind of pressure on the knee. I don't know if the gi itself may obscure some of the things that are going on there. Good point. But, I mean, even, especially if they go belly down, for example, and you can't really see what's happening. You there couldn't are... see the heel position when Victor Hugo's gi was over. It's only when he released the leg lock that you could actually see the right. heel, right? So there, there is some of that. I don't know how much of a factor that really is, but sure. it's worth considering. Um, but I, I, I do think when you see the no gi variations, very clear that oh, there's there's something else happening here besides simply an ankle, an ankle for lock. For sure, for sure. And I don't want to take anything away from Victor Hugo's win. It was a very impressive submission win against a very tough opponent, Muhammad Ali. Uh, Victor Hugo looked amazing in the tournament. Uh, he took the $20,000 prize home. And, um, you know, uh, 
it was it was a really impressive win. It was took two two and a half minutes to tap out Muhammad Ali, which is you know no joke. But I think that the Leo Vieira's call for clarification. Uh, about this submission attack. It was met with a lot of support from within the community. A lot of people on his page, including industry figures and even athletes, were kind of saying, you know, yeah, let's let's talk about it. And I think that's the important mm -hmm. thing. It's about starting a conversation and ultimately whatever decision is made, it's fine. But it's not a bad thing to have that conversation. No, no, we'll see what happens next. I think it's worthwhile, like you said. But uh, real, real quickly, I feel like that moment maybe overshadowing some of the awesome stuff that happened in the GP. For example, Muhammad Ali's first match with Philippe Andrew is like Phenomenal. an instant favorite of mine. Incredible, so much action, especially from guys that are in the super heavy, ultra heavyweight category. Sometimes those matches can get a little slow towards the eight minute mark or so on. That was a banger the entire yeah. time. It was it was really fun. As a modern classic, right? Immediately, mm -hmm. so that's like going to become one of those ones that we'll talk about for a few years for sure. Because like they've gone uh, they've gone head to head a couple times, and actually, Flippy Andrew has beaten Muhammad both times, uh, the World Championships and the Pan Championships in years past. And Muhammad is coming off a long, long layoff as well. Mm -hmm. We've not really seen him compete too much this year. He did a couple of gi matches at um, AJP, uh, AJP Grand Slam in Miami. He had a couple of no gi super fights in Brazil. Didn't look great. I'll be honest. Did not look great. But Muhammad hadn't competed since early 2020 because where he lives, uh, the restrictions around COVID have made it very difficult for him to get consistent training. Like Jamil Hill was telling me the other day that, that his gym is still closed to public classes, mm. you know, that, that he has to do pro training elsewhere. And yet, Tim Spriggs, who is also part of the Team Lloyd Irvin network and lives 30 minutes away and trains at Crazy 88, can train no problem. And they've got kids' classes running and stuff because mm -hmm. every county, every city has slightly different rules. So uh, Mohammed's in a situation where he hasn't had optimal training for so long. So to see him come back and to do that with Muhammad, uh, against Felipe Andrew was pretty awesome, right? It really was. And then, of course, we have Tyron Dalpres, a middleweight run. Phenomenal. Absolutely a, a master class, right? Tyna makes no mistakes. His technique is so clean and precise. Uh, I really think he represents the new wave of grapplers coming up to the ranks. We'll touch on that more uh, right. a little bit later. But, uh, man, he's a front runner to me, even though it's still his <laughs> first season as a black belt, technically. Well, he looks very seasoned, he's, doesn't he? He looks very, very uh, much like a veteran. And so. he's right around like about 11 months as a black belt yep. or something like Just that. Just turned 21 years old. It's terrifying, to be honest. He did. So. He, looked, he looked flawless against Hinato Canuto. Uh, he was able to shut Hinato's game down, and that's not an easy thing to do because mm -hmm. Hinato Canuto is very wily, very tricky, very dynamic. Tynan played a perfect game. And then he submitted uh, submitted Jonathan Gracie in, I think, just uh, about three and a half minutes, approximately. And um, didn't get a point scored on him. You know, it was just incredible, man. Absolutely incredible. Uh, looked so good. And uh, love to see that, uh, that, like you say, the new blood coming through, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's uh, that's it from our quick uh, recap of the events last weekend in the IBJJF Masters Worlds, and of course the the, the Grand Prix. There, you can catch all the uh, highlights and the matches on the site. We uh, also interviewed many people while we were in uh, Las Vegas last weekend, right? Because as you said, celebration of jujitsu, a lot of people all under the same roof, everybody having a good time, everybody in good spirits, and um, one person that we were able to catch up with was Andre Galvão. So they had the nice big Atos stand. I, I like the white leather couches that they had mm -hmm, and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, everybody chilling out over there. Like you said, you went to the seminar, um, you caught the, with, uh, with Murasaki and, and Rafael Aguedes. But um, one thing that we weren't able to report on recently uh, because we haven't been in the studio is that Andre Galvao announced that he's going back to MMA. Well, we did mention it, but we didn't have a lot of details, right? He right. came out with the teaser uh, before the last Grappin' Bolton podcast. We said, oh, he's going back. What could that mean? Well, right. of course, we had to ask him about that. So we caught up with Andre, talked about a few different things, but this is a small clip from an interview we had with him where he discusses you know, how the, the one championship deal came about and what his plans might be next. Tyler, go ahead and, and roll this clip here. Back in the day when I fought MMA, my no-gi jiu-jitsu wasn't like the, the no-gi that I have nowadays, you know? So now I'm better wrestler. You know, now I know wrestling, I understand wrestling. And jiu-jitsu evolved so much that uh, it, it, it helped me to, to develop like my no-gi, right? So with that being said, I, I, I thought like, man, you know what? I will, I will, I will showcase my jiu-jitsu in MMA. I, I need that, you know, I'll, I'll do my best. And one championship started like reaching me out, and my manager George Guimarães reached me, and then he said, "Man, uh, we have this opportunity. Are you down?" I'm like, "You know what? 
I'll do it. And also, I was training Emiliano, uh, Emiliano Sword. He's like the PFL champion. And a lot of MMA fighters come to Atos to train their nogi. So I was rolling with them, training them, talking with them, even like helping them like with sparring and stuff like that. I'm like, man, I'm still doing well. So let me, let me, let me, uh, let me do this again, you know? So I have the love for the fight. I love what I do. And I'll just go there and do my best, you know, as I always do. So we're, we're there 100%. I signed a contract of a two-year contract, uh, six fights, you know? And let's see, let's see. Oh, well, I'll, be, I'll be fighting probably around February and March. That's pretty incredible, actually, it, uh, that Galvao is 39 years of age, right? And people forget, I think, people forget because they focus so much on his uh, amazing jiu-jitsu and grappling career, you know, multiple time IBJJF world champion, ADCC super fight champion, and everything that he's done in the grappling world. Mm -hmm. And they forget that he is a seven fight veteran in MMA because his last fight was all the way back in 2010. Now, it is a long time ago, and incidentally, his last match was actually against Tyrone Woodley before he went on to become the, the Tyrone Woodley UFC champion that we know today. So Galvao, who's 39 and hasn't fought in 11 years, is saying, I've still got it. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to fight. That's incredible. It is. It's really exciting. And I... I We'll be completely honest. I didn't think he was going to fight anytime as soon as February or March. I know, or right? April, whatever he said there, but in the spring. I mean, I thought it might be after ATC, for example, that right. he, he would consider it. But I guess there's one way to get in shape for something like ADCC, and that would be to do an MMA camp or two. Fair point. Um, so, I, I mean, you got to love it. Andre is one of the best ever to do it. Still hungry, still chasing new goals. Uh, I'm excited to see what you can do in 1FC. Me too, me too. You know, one championship, they've signed a lot of big names, haven't they? Uh, including, of course, Marcus Buchesha, who we'll talk about in a second. And, uh, of course, Gordon Ryan actually has a deal with mm -hmm. one championship. And that does beg the question, doesn't it, that could one day do we see Andre and Gordon strap on the gloves as well? Because, be... of course, they're targeted to compete against each other at the ADCC mm -hmm. Super Fight in 2022. But after what happened earlier this year, you know, people are saying that they should fight for real. Maybe that opens the door. Maybe it does. We'll see. We'll see what happens next. That would be quite quite something interesting. Yeah, but Galvao is 5-2 and two in MMA. And, uh, you know, of his five wins, three were by submission and one was by TKO. So mm. let's see if he can go and, like he said, you know, sort of display some of his jujitsu in the, in, the, in the ring once again. It would be really cool to see. So, uh, big event. Big event went down last weekend in London, England. First time this event has taken place. It's called Raw Grappling Championship. We previewed it plenty of times here on the show leading into the event, but we finally got to watch it. And man, what a good event it was. Looked like a million dollars. This is a very, very high level event. And they brought in some very big names as well. So they had uh, a number of things that were special about this event, including an eight man GP, and two very notable super fights. The super fights between Lovato Jr. and Adam Wodzinski, and then Lucas Hulk Barboza versus Gerard Lubinski, a black belt from Poland. And the A-Man GP featured a mix of talents, including ADCC champion uh, Yuri Samoyes, Patrick Gaudio, uh, Josh Hinger, three-time Nogi World Champion, plus ADCC bronze medalist, and then uh, a bunch of up-and-comers from Europe as well. So it was really fun. We got a highlight video that we can roll while we're talking about this event, and we can kind of talk about some of the results. Because um, the GP, of course, I think was the, the one that you know people were interested to see as to who would come out on top in that one. But the, uh, the super fights as well, were they, they were all their own interest, right? And look at it. This event looked great. It had a, a quite a unique rule set in that it was points uh, for 10-minute matches, and then what would happen is if it was a draw at the end of those 10 minutes, they had a two-minute overtime, mm. and uh, where it was not a golden score, but it was you know if you scored, then you would win. If not, then it would be a decision. And some of the matches in the GP were awesome. Like we saw just there, Bradley Hill versus Josh Hinger was a banger. That was a great match. Taylor Perman, right here, hits the submission of the night, the, uh, the good old leg lace. Uh, Yuri Samoyes was on fire. He was the eventual winner of the tournament. His top game, his wrestling, his power passing, man, he was just, wasn't, he was taking no prisoners. But one thing that surprised me, and we got to look at it here, was Patrick Gaudio was constantly hunting for leg locks in every match. Um, he ended up fighting through to the final, but... 
Man, he came very close wow, to tapping. Wow, very wow. close to tapping to this heel hook to Josh Hingle that right here. That was nearly there. Yeah, I think the hand kind of came up and fluttered for a second, you know. But, um, man, you know, the wrestling was definitely a factor as well. Gaudio was able to pop his head out. This was actually in overtime as well. Really nice back take to, to get the points and the win. And then that set up the final between um, Yuri a, and Gaudio. That was pass, by the way, using the hands to kind of swing. Wasn't that dirty? That was really cool. Man, Yuri, when Yuri is on, Yuri is on. Oh, here's the submission from uh, Lucas Hulk Barboza. I love the green rash guard, by the way. Uh, very fitting. Hulk style. Hulk style gets the submission win. And the belt, which is nice. And then the match between uh, Rafael Levado Jr. and Wodzinski. Well, we talked a lot about is a clash of generations, a clash of styles. And, man, Levado just looked unsweepable. His top game, his pressure passing, you know, he really didn't give Adam much space to work whatsoever. And Adam's got a fantastic guard, but he was able to use that top game and uh, take a, a win. And, I, I, yeah, it was by a negative point. I'm not exactly, exactly sure where the negative point comes from. I have to go back and check. But Lovato, that's actually the second title belt that he's claimed in London. Because London is where he won his Bellator oh, middleweight course. MMA championship. Of course, of course. And here we see our final now with Patrick Gaudio and, and Yuri. This, this was surely a hardly a hard contested fight. Physical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very physical. I mean, you know, Gaudio is a brute, but has an amazing bottom game and has a, a really, really well-developed guard. And Yuri, I mean, his wrestling and his top game, uh, that's how he won two ADCC championships, right? Mm -hmm. his, his top mm -hmm. game is phenomenal. And I don't think I really saw him on bottom at all in the entire tournament. So he he had to win by decision. It was a close match, but it was a great event. Yeah, for a first-time event, uh, really, really impressed from the matches to the production level uh, to the stakes at hand here. I can't wait to see what they come back with. You know, it, it's really exciting to see pro shows coming back to Europe and uh, as the scene opens up over there. Yeah, Josh Hinger was able to take third in that to the uh, GP as well with a, uh, a win against Taylor Pearman. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the actual tournament itself was, uh, was, was a lot of fun. I like seeing one night tournaments. I'm a big fan of that because it's not just the, the result that matters. It's how people kind of battle through them. It always creates like a little bit of drama. And to be honest, when you have uh, so many matches laid out in a, in a format like that, you can get some great ones. And I, I really recommend that, that of the matches, like I said, that opening round match between Bradley Hill and Josh Hinger was so much fun. It was so many submission attempts flying back and forth. It was really, it's one of those ones on the short list for, you know, best matches of the year. It's not a very short list anymore. It's a very, very long list. It's been now. a good year for, for competition to just. It yeah. has been a good year. But um we, we were able to catch up with the uh with the winners, Yuri Samoyes, Rafael Lovato Jr. and Lucas Hulk. We got some interview clips from these guys. Let's hear what they have to say. Training for this tournament. Well, not really because I think he was one of the, he was the last guy to come in the tournament, so I was already preparing for the tournament, you know, way before he uh, joined. Uh, and I don't try to, like, get ready for anybody in particular because I don't know who I'm going to fight, you know, just from experience. Like, I used to be, like, the kind of guy, like, I, was, I would worry for the toughest guy on the bracket, and then I would get a tougher guy, you know, like, that's in the lower belts. Sometimes I end up even losing, and then I'm like, man, I was focused on someone that I didn't even, you know, face, so... I just try to focus on winning the tournament, whoever I, you know, face, and it's just focus on my game, on myself. And, you know, once the, the brackets were on, I was just focused on my first opponent. That's usually how I take it. 88 kilos, I'm down to fight. My division, the number one. I don't care what, uh, you know, um, what people say, but I, you know, I'm the, I'm the most active fighter at 88 kilo. So just fighting a lot of all these guys, all the events, nobody here like, to challenge me. You know, I was expecting to fight Craig Johnny, but he's always like running away. <laughs> but it's all good. Craig is a nice dude, I guess, you know. He's worried about Gabi Garcia, but I'm worried about actually fighting your guys, real opponents. Um, um, not, nothing against Gabi Garcia, right? But I, I, I know that, you know, I'm focused on my division. I'm focused on being the number one at it, and I am the number one. Oh man, now it's ridiculous. The, the kids these days, you know, they're, uh, they're just so good, and they're getting so good so fast. You know, in my time, um, you know, you, you were at least in your 20s, you know, before you're um, able to be on par with, uh, with the world's best. And now you're seeing 16, 17, 18 year old kids already beating. Uh, world-class black belts, which is just insane to me. Um, so, you know, the athleticism, the technique, the innovations, 
um, you know, the speed, the creativity of, of the new generation, these kids coming up is, is just, um, it's amazing. Um, yeah, so some quick excerpts there from all of our champs, and you guys can watch the full videos coming soon to Flow Grappling. But I wanted to highlight kind of some different aspects from each guy there. And we saw Yuri talk about how he used to get some anxiety, thinking too hard about his opponents, getting too too locked in on certain strategies, and then maybe not even facing that person as the bracket shaked out. So he wasn't too worried about Gaudio in particular. He was just staying ready for anybody. And then, uh, of course, you got to love Hulk calling out Craig Jones, saying, come at, come at me, that, that fight has... Our match has fallen apart, I think, at two or three different times due to injuries or other things happening. It is funny, isn't it, that they've been uh, scheduled to face off so many times. I've lost count and that it's just never, never come about. But I, uh, I definitely feel like Hulk thinks that uh, that Craig has his eyes, uh, his sight set somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. I would love to see that match. I think it's an awesome Craig versus Gabby. Me too. Yeah, it'd be awesome. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe Hulk needs to go out and he needs to beat Gabby Garcia to fight his way against, you know, face off with Craig then, so. Gabby you know. the gatekeeper, I like that. The and then gatekeeper. we have uh, Lovato, I thought it was a really nice sentiment there when he was asked about what he thought about the, the upcoming generation oh, in so jiu-jitsu. Cool. You know, for, for a veteran like him, who's also managed to stay successful at the highest level for the better part of two decades now. Still winning. Still winning. Um, is something special. So I thought that was really nice. Um, again, they, they, of course, cover more in their interviews and talk about their matches, but I wanted to get a, a variety there, a little spice. Yeah, I thought it was really cool as well. Um, I got to say, you know, n no great surprise to see uh, competitors like Yuri Lovado and, and Lucas Hulk winning. Uh, Hulk looked amazing. That, that submission was so clean. Um, his opponent isn't particularly well known, but he's very, very tough. And uh, I, I definitely very interested in seeing Hulk take on some really tough challenges next. He competes a lot. Don't forget, just busy. a week ago, he tapped out Dorino in Brazil. And then, like, six days later, he's in London, and he's tapping out some very high-level European opponents as well. So, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool indeed. So, moving on. The Abu Dhabi World Pro is happening right now. Right here on Flow Grappling. You can watch it live all week. The tournament actually started, uh, I want to say, on Saturday. And it's going to run through till Friday. There are many different divisions and uh, parts to this, to, to this tournament. It's a huge extravaganza set in Abu Dhabi. It's the World Pro Jiu-Jitsu Championship. And it contains, you know, it contains kids, it contains juveniles, it has Masters Championships. But our eyes are completely locked onto the Black Belt divisions that are coming up later this week, right? You got it, you got it. And we got a highlight here from the, my last trip, actually, to, to the World Pro in Abu Dhabi. To help you have some color, give you some of the vibes. You can see it's a very, very unique setup there. It's, it's the most professional-looking event in the world. 100%. You know, it, it is a, a gorgeous arena built strictly for jiu-jitsu competition, and they invite all the best talent. Here we see kind of Duarte doing his thing. But uh, present this year, we have an interesting mix of athletes. And it's worth noting before we reel these off here, I think, that the country qualifiers always create a lot of drama and intrigue and we often see what might be in a normal bracket too with the favorites well one of them has to go out before they even enter at the main bracket how great point so there are the rules of this tournament it is a true world championship there is a limit on the number of competitors per country that can compete so you can only have two uh competitors per main bracket for of the same nationality. So for example, if you're talking about the black belt heavyweight division, you can only have two Brazilians in that bracket. And you know, there's uh, it's it's not a case where you'll have 10 Brazilians and maybe two other nationalities. No, no, it's a true world championship. You'll see many different countries represented. And uh, of course the Brazilians usually do pretty well, but it, it definitely opens the door up to see some matches you may not see in other tournaments. Of course, most of the champions do look the same. Beatrice Mesquita, Felipe Pena, Kainan Duarte, Isaac Payens, uh, many others. And just taking a look at some of the names that are signed up for these divisions, I'm expecting some fireworks over the next couple of days. Just looking in the uh, in the heavyweight division alone, man, the, the 94 kilogram division's got Felipe Pena and Anderson Muniz signed up. Uh, Muniz is, of course, is uh, the dream art black belt and one of the one of the fastest rising stars in the kind of the black belt divisions at the moment. Whereas Felipe Pena is a multiple time Abu Dhabi World Pro Champion, looking to capture another gold in the heavyweight division. I cannot wait to see the return of Nicholas Marigali going up against athletes such as Ricardo Evangelista and Guta. Berg Pereira. In the uh, middleweight division, Isaac Bayens will return to try and capture gold once again. And he has to go up against some very tough competition. And then, of course, we mentioned the women as well. Bianca Basilio is signed up in the 55 kilo division. She's a world pro champion, as is Beatrice Mesquita at 62 kilos. And 
Gabby Pisania in the women's 95 kilogram division. Don't forget, she took gold at the last Abu Dhabi World Pro. This just all conquering black belts and uh, looking to take over the heavyweight division. So some really exciting matches coming up over the next couple of days. The time difference for those of you watching in Europe or in the States means that usually you'll wake up each morning and the action will already be over. But of course, you can go back and you can catch all the recaps, results, and replays right here on Flow Grappling. It's a lot of fun, Abu Dhabi World Pro, right? It's a very different tournament as well, like the six minute matches, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. slightly different points. It's um, it's it, it definitely looks and feels different to any other events, right? Yeah, very high pace. I feel like uh, the, the shorter time limits, of course, uh, enforcing that a little bit, but. I, I do love World Pro. I love the country qualifiers, probably because I'm not Brazilian. I'm sure they have different feelings about that. Oh, yeah. Um, but it, it's a cool event, and I'll definitely be tuning in. Cool, 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 cool. Well, moving on, uh, we should talk about the fact that the IBJJF World Championships is coming up. And it is not that far away. 24 days today, I want to say. <laughs> wow, it's uh, here. It is right around the corner. The IBJJF World Championships goes down in Anaheim, California. December 9th through 12th, four days of action. And this is the first IBJJF World Championships since June of 2019. It has been a very, very long time since we've had the IBJJF Worlds, but it's finally here and people are very excited for it. Now, of course, this is helped by the fact that very recently the United States lifted majority of the travel restrictions early november they lifted it so that now it's a lot easier for people from other countries to enter the united states whereas before people had to pass through uh other countries and spend at least two weeks uh, in those as like a stopover and enter via approved countries that now it's possible to enter directly so that means we will see a lot more brazilians a lot more europeans japanese Australian, you name it, everybody's going to be congregating. They're going to be there in California for what I'm sure is the most anticipated tournament of the year. And uh, I don't know about you, Chase, but I feel like 2021 is the year of the next generation. Yeah, I couldn't be uh, a, a more agreement with you, Hal. I mean, we were talking about Tynan Dalpa earlier, but I wanted to save his name for this discussion because for me, I might consider him actually a front runner, perhaps, in the middleweight division. You know, of course, experience counts for a lot. Yeah. And some of these uh, other athletes have been there for the better part of five, seven, eight years. But I don't know, man. <laughs> Watching him through the course of this season, and he's not alone, of course, but I, I feel nope. like... He's made a statement, and to me, I'm watching him very closely going to the World Championships. I mean, I don't think it's an exaggeration to put him up there with a list of front runners, like you say, and, and possibly even favorites. Of course, we're still waiting to see who else is going to sign up in that division. The hyper-competitive middleweight division is one of, mm -hmm. if not the mm -hmm. toughest division to win, usually just in terms of uh, sheer, sheer numbers and the level of talent. I'd say light and middleweight are, are two of the most difficult. And um, it's, it's early days. Uh, so we're not seeing the, the full list of names who are signed up yet because a lot of people will, will hang back. They'll only put their name in uh, right at the last minute to kind of like, you know, keep it a secret as to which division they're going to mm -hmm. enter. But, I mean, we can take a quick look right now at the middleweight division. And there are some really good names signed up. Ronaldo Jr., Tommy Langacker, Yago de Souza, Hibamart, you know. So there's already some high-level names. But right now there are only 12 names confirmed for the middleweight division. I'm expecting that to grow a lot. Oh, I would love to see Tommy Langacker versus uh, Tynan. That would be something right. crazy. Yeah, it really the would. The power pressure of Tynan on top versus, you know, Langacker's crazy guard. Mm. <laughs> That's mm. a nice match. Uh, I say that there's, uh, I feel that like there's, there's the, this question about the next generation, right? The kind of the young blood, because we've seen it a lot this year, right? We've seen a lot of new faces. Kind of making their way to the top of the podium. Just look at Pans recently. You know, you've got athletes such as you know Jonta Alves, also of Art of Jiu Jitsu. Um, you know, you've got Tynan and, and many others. Kind of look, get into the top of the podium because we're definitely seeing a changing of the guard. Right, certain athletes are phasing out. You have a number of competitors who possibly are in a transitional phase in their career. You know, some guys such as Marcus Bouchesha, for example, you know, he's focused more on MMA now. And there are other competitors. There's a big question mark over, for example, Lucas Lepre. You know, will the, the I believe, six-time IBJJF World Lightweight Champion, will he return 
nobody really seems to know. And, you know, after such a long layoff, and of course he's in his mid to late 30s now, uh, a guy like that who's, you know, focused on his family and his gym, you know, will he be able to get ready for the World Championships? Mm. Or has he decided that six is enough and he'll and he'll let the uh, the young guns take over? Some veterans have definitely signed up. Bruno Malfasini is signed up in the Roosterweight division. Of course, everybody knows him. But you look at divisions such as the light featherweights, and, you know, we... Uh, you can see here that you know, Diego Pato is signed up. Uh, you also got Josh Cisneros. You know, this is the first time that either of these will be competing as black belts at the IBJJF World Championships. We're also expecting to see uh, grapplers such as um, such as May Ramalvez, right, or Mayra Makane, as, the, as they like to call them as well. Um, in the featherweights, um, Jamil Hill Taylor has already told us, and he's actually signed up already. He's going to be in there, as will uh, Mateus Gabriel. Both returning World Championships, still in the early phases of their career. But they'll have to take on some brand new names, such as Fabricio Andre and many others. So it's, um, it's an intriguing World Championships, and I feel like we may see a lot of new faces crown champion. I have to agree with that. And for me, I'm especially excited about the Absolute Red because oh, yeah. as much as I love Bouchesha running through the, uh, the crowd, the idea of a new Absolute Champ is, is pretty intriguing. Who might right. step up to claim that, right? So as these divisions do fill in and some of the, the names make themselves known, that's where my mind's going. Is, okay, who's going to be looking for double gold? That's a great point. And it's also, um, we feel like we had a little bit of a preview for the Absolute Division last weekend in the IBJJF Heavyweight GP, right? Because with Gustavo Batista, Victor Hugo, Felipe Andrew, and Muhammad Ali, mm -hmm. you have to say that those four guys are pretty strong candidates for the Absolute Division should they choose to do both the weight class and the Absolute. And of course, there are a few notable names not signed up, right? Like, when you talk about Absolute, you add in guys like Nicholas Marigali. Or let's say Eric Muniz, you know, or many of the other kind of like Joao Gabriel Hosha, for example. Will he be signed up? Will he still go there to compete? I feel that um, it could be, it could get pretty interesting um, come early December. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I gotta say, I'm super excited for the World Championships, and I'm sure everybody else is as well. Uh, we did actually get confirmation as well from Matthias Gabriel, who told us that he has confirmed the uh, weight class that he's going to compete in. Basically, Lucas Leitch, his coach, told him, you're going to have to do featherweight. Mateus well, he's like, won it before. I mean, no, no, no sense in changing things up there, maybe. No, no, for sure. But I think the dieting was, you know, oh, 20, 20, 20, 20, 25 pounds weight cut. He's like, oh, okay then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, Mateus going, of course, for his second gold medal, won in 2019 as a first year black belt. That was phenomenal. Um, so we know some big names who are in for the IBJJF Worlds, but also... We know of some names that definitely won't be doing Worlds this year. Mm. And this is interesting because, you know, of course, we talked about Bouchesha. He's got an MMA fight literally the very weekend before uh, the World Championships. He's now focused on that. Um, we definitely know that some people are coming back, but we can say for sure, we can say for sure that certain grapplers will not be competing in the Worlds. They confirmed for us last weekend, including Gianni Grippo who's going to miss his first world championships since 2006. That's a crazy stat. He competed in every IBJJF world championships from 2007 through to 2019. 12 years without missing a single IBJJF world tournament from juvenile blue belt all the way through to black belt. But he's decided that this year he's been too focused on no gi to flip-flop between the two styles. Mm -hmm. And he's going to... Uh, he's he's making a run at West Coast Trials. Oh, yeah. That's the move. I mean, he did pretty good at East Coast as well, yeah, right? Yeah, he so, did, but he didn't punch a stick yet. So not yet. You have to think that's his focus, right? Who else has uh, said that they're not doing Worlds this year? Well, similar vein there. We have Heisen Rita. Bumped into him there at Masters Worlds. And he said, you know, he's definitely focusing on Nogi. He's going to go to the trials uh, over in Europe, right? And so that will be like the second trials, what he said. Because it's not just the European trials. It also covers other nations as well. Correct. Including Africa. And so that's where his citizenship is. And he... Um, uh, that's rather continent, not nation, rather. Correct. But um, yeah, he'll be doing that. So he's focused on that. And uh, I think that might be a, a similar sort of uh, situation for many athletes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there are definitely a few that are out via injury, though, um, and serious injuries, you know, to be saying that they're not doing the world championships. Uh, Orlando Montero um, caught up with him for the first time in a long time. He's been very busy uh, with his school in Hawaii. And um, he said that, man, yeah, I'm not going to be able to compete. He's been out since December 2020. He's been unable to compete all year. Such a shame. Love watching that guy it's compete. About two years. December 2020. Oh, excuse me. 
Yeah, <laughs> it'll be a year in it. Yeah, yeah. Because last competition that he won was the Orlando Open in December of last year, um, and then Vitor Oliveira as well, uh, the GF team black belt. Who I thought actually I was expecting to see him compete at Masters Worlds. Right, he's a Masters World champion and he's a certified badass. And you know, age is not a barrier for that guy. You'll see him compete in the uh, in the adult divisions as well. But he's walking around with his arm in a sling. I'm like, man, what's up, Vitor? What happened? He's like. I tore my bicep playing disc golf. So crazy that that's the way he goes down, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you couldn't make it up. I mean, turns out disc golf's pretty dangerous, huh? Who yeah. knew? Look out. Who knew? So um, that's that's it for Worlds for now. We'll basically, we'll be just talking about Worlds nonstop as it comes up over the next couple of weeks. We're very, very close to Worlds now. But uh, yeah, just to, uh, let's finish off the show, shall we, with some quick news and results. Uh, we talked a little about Marcus Bouchesha, Almeida. He is going to fight MMA on December 4th. He is signed to fight on one championship. He's going to meet a knockout artist, Kang G1 of Korea, in a heavyweight match on Friday, 3rd of December. And uh, yeah, this is his second fight. Yeah, well, it could be more excited watching get back into the, the cage, right? Quick turnaround. Amazing, am amazing first performance he had there, that submission win. And, uh, I mean, this is a scary opponent, right? It's a real test yeah. for him. Let's see what he can do. Yeah, this guy is scary, actually. He's uh, he's 5-0 in MMA, and all of his fights have ended via KO or TKO in the first round. He's got some hands. He's also big. He's six foot, and he's 265 pounds. He's a legit heavyweight. But so was the last guy that uh, Bouchesha faced, right? That's right, and he handled it very nicely. So, I mean, I, I'm behind Bouchesha. I'm hoping he does well, but... Again, we'll see what he can do. Coming up quick, though, December 4th. It's right around the corner. It is. It really is. Uh, December 3rd. Friday, December 3rd. Yeah, very, very soon. Uh, what else we got? Uh, Estevan Martinez. Uh, we got a little highlight video as well that we can play of this while we're talking about him. Estevan Martinez won the Hudson Valley Invitational 135-pound pro tournament. And uh, <laughs> this was classic Giant Slayer. Oh, yeah. He's, he's really just uh, come out this year um, with a bang, right? Must watch athlete, so entertaining, but also successful, right? He's he really very good at what he does, despite being a showman. So I, I love it. I love you can mix both things together and find success like that. Man, the thing about Estevan is look at this one, two, and I want to say there's a third coming right here and he lands it. You know, it's like you look at it, it looks chaotic, right? It looks just like he's going balls to the wall the I entire would say time. It is that. <laughs> it is, but it works. Yeah, like yeah. he's managed to to actually like create a methodology about being just this uncontrollable force. It's like he is just a ball of energy. He's never he not nonstop. He's got great wrestling. He's almost impossible to submit. I don't think I've ever seen anybody submit him in his weight class. And he is just a phenomenal, phenomenal competitor. So it's great to see him take a win like this at the Hudson Valley event. You can go back and you watch all his matches on Flow Grappling. Actually, we have the uh, the entire tournament there to watch. But um, Estevan, man, you know, just constantly rising through the ranks, in my opinion. You know, I think the 135-pound division, especially in Nogi, we need some challenges for the number one Mikey Musumichi, right? And I think mm -hmm. Estevan is kind of, uh, kind of making a case for that match down the road. I think it would be entertaining. I'll give it that much. That would be a lot of fun. And Estevan really is, you know, I think people may not may write him off a bit too quickly because, like, oh, he just kind of spams flying attacks and cartwheels. But like you said, there is a methodology. He is doing something that is working quite well at the highest level. I, yeah, I think that match isn't as crazy as it might sound on, on at face value with yeah. Mikey. He overwhelms his opponents mm -hmm. with that mm -hmm. pressure and with that constant movement. It's uh, it's really a, something spectacular to see. But yeah, go back and watch the uh, the entire run on uh, the site. We have his all of his matches on there. And the last thing that we want to talk about before we get out of here today is the fact that Grapple Fest have another event coming up. Uh, here on Flow Grappling in uh, just uh, five days. It's taking place this weekend. November 20th, we have Grapple Fest number 10. This is their first event of 2021 after a very, very long layoff. They had an event in mid-2020. It was a closed-door special event. Uh, remember that one very well. It was Fionn Davis versus Tyane. That was a wild match, yeah. Yeah, one for the ages. I think we put down the match of the year contender for 2020. Uh, but Grapple Fest 10 is scheduled to go down in Liverpool, England, and 
It is a pretty cool card because, of course, they feature a ton of local regional talent from in UK and uh, in a bunch of no-gi submission-only matches. But they always invite a couple of really big names to kind of headline the event. And, well, Chase, why don't you tell us about the kind of the main card matches that they've got? Yeah, the top three matches are, are pretty incredible there. We've got Dante Leon versus Oliver Taza. Cade Ruotolo versus Keith Ukorian, and Ty Ruotolo versus Nick Ron. And all of those, to me, are extremely competitive and dynamic matchups. Yes, they are. Dante uh, is a, um, a Grapple Fest Super Fight winner. Um, Cade Ruotolo and Ty Ruotolo both return into Grapple Fest as well. Um, Dante and Ty actually fought on, a, on an event uh, on Grapple Fest. Very uh, different looking Ty, though. Yeah, a lot has changed since then, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Cade versus Keith Gregorian. Keith came very close to uh, qualifying for ADCC at uh, the East Coast Trials, fought, fought through to the finals there. Of course, Cade did qualify by winning the 77 kilo division. They're kind of meeting in the middle here. It's a, a 70 kilogram match. It's about 155 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, and then Ty Rotolo taking on the uh, the Sarah BJJ black belt Nick Ronan, who has been spotted training plenty in the blue basement there in New York, kind of part of the extended Henzo Gracie network. And apparently is a, is a great leg locker, a good competitor, and Ty is going to be competing against him at 77. So Dante versus Tazer is a good one as well. I don't think they've ever faced off. Yeah, I have to double check that for you, but I like that that matchup there. Taza is sometimes plagued by opponents that don't want to engage with him, and I feel like Dante Leon is going to be the exact opposite of that. Oh, Dante's yeah. more than happy to wade into something as dangerous as Oliver Taza's guard. So that should be a lot of fun. I think it's going to be an interesting showcase. Uh, interesting uh, you mentioned that he's going to go into Oliver's guard. Wait, you, you're predicting Oliver's going to play from bottom. He's been wrestling he, a lot His lately. wrestling did look really good in the right? past. I, I agree, I agree, but... Um, Even Dante might pull... Dante, may, Dante has an excellent guard as he well. Has an excellent guard. I, I'm yeah. sure we'll see a bit of everything. It's submission only that right. allows them to really open their games. But um, I twenty feel, minute I match feel like as well. people are are mostly afraid of Taza from the bottom. Right. They're worried about getting their legs tangled up. And I, I think if Taza does take that angle, Dante will be game to meet that head on. Yeah, I don't think Dante's scared of going head to head with somebody in a shootout like that. Right. But you are right. Taza's wrestling uh, specifically against Mika Galvao looked really, really good at WNO. I remember that a few months ago. Yeah. Um, Dante, of course, known as one of the best wrestlers as well as uh, an athlete with some of the best wrestle ups from guard uh, in the business. Interesting to see how they'll apply that in this rule format, though, because it's a 20 minute submission only. And uh, if there is no uh, submission, then it goes to a decision. And, uh, you know, it's a judge on kind of overall grappling, you know, just much like who's number one rules. It's, uh, you know, there's no sort of uh, extra weight given to submission attacks or one thing or the other. You know, it's a pretty fair judging system. But uh, how that plays out, I don't know. I really don't know if they're just going to go after the submission and, and, and not care about positional wrestling. But you can bet your bottom dollar. Cade Rotolo and Ty Rotolo. They only have one style, right? Mm -hmm. And it is... Mm -hmm. It's just all out attack all the time, top, bottom, flying dust jokes, you name it. They're just always looking for the finish, right? That's an accurate description, absolutely. But after this weekend, I'm not betting on anything anymore. No more betting for me. No more, <laughs> no more gambling. <laughs> yeah, like we said, we were in Las Vegas last weekend. So dreams were shattered. <laughs> <laughs> Very excited. You can watch Grapple Fest 10 uh, go down on Flow Grappling on November 20th. And that's going to be a ton of fun. ton of fun. Cool. Well, I think that's pretty much it from this weekend, right? Uh, lots of results to to discuss, but I think all eyes from here on out. You know, we do have plenty of events to watch here on Flow Grappling between now and the end of the year. But with the IBJJF World Champions Championships coming up in just a couple of weeks, just over three weeks away, just to let you know that we will be bringing back. The Road to Worlds series. Oh, it just slips in the breaking news segment right here at the oh. very end. Yeah, I can't wait for that trip. Uh, Road to Worlds is, is one of the best things we've ever put together at Flow Grappling, I can confidently say. A lot of fun. Definitely a great way to get uh, everyone in the spirit of Worlds, get everyone hyped. So that will start very, very shortly here, a couple of weeks. So Yeah, we're going to be sending uh, a squad to uh, Southern California to just hit that just that incredibly densely populated area of jiu-jitsu gyms right there from San Diego up to L.A. And Chase and I, we're going to be boarding a plane to New York to go and catch up with the Unity crew there in Manhattan because Leandro Lowe is training there right now with those guys. And they're going to be putting together a really powerful camp. You're going to have guys like Talison Suarez, you know, Diego Pato, Misa Bastos. Devontae Johnson, Levi Jones-Leary, Marillo Santana, 
and of course Leandro Lowe. So that's going to be a lot of fun, man. There's going to be a lot, a lot of other names I'm missing out as well. But that's the, a tough room. Yeah. The Unity room is phenomenal. It's always a lot of fun. Great vibes to go there and get some training stuff. I know a lot of people are very excited to see what Leandro is going to be like this year. But uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of cool stuff coming out from it. Vlogs, interviews, training rounds, you name it. We'll be getting stuff from a little bit of everybody. We've already talked about the gyms we're going to hit up in Southern California. And you can rest assured we're going to hit up all the major academies. Yeah, stay tuned, guys. Like I said, I can't wait. So it's going to be fun. All right, guys. Well, that's it for this week's episode. We'll be back next week and more. Catch you later.